This is Writer Life, a podcast about writing, life, coffee and conversation with Robin John Morgan. Hello and welcome to the Writer Life podcast. In today's episode, I want to take a look back at Heirs to the Kingdom and also look to a degree at what it hopefully will be the next book which is in production at the, as we speak and it's not that far away from publication which my next book will be The Countess of Darkness. Now since I began what has turned out to be a much longer than expected journey in the writing of Heirs to the Kingdom which is the dystopian adventure fantasy series I started back in 2007. I found myself immersed in many questions that reflect the reality of life today. In a sense, it's odd to look back and realize how much modern life has influenced what, you know, to a degree is a post-apocalyptic tale with its roots well and firmly planted in the dark ages. When I finally finished what was the 14 year process of writing the eight books, I was left with this wonderful group of characters that I developed over all of that time. I had a wealth of material that was simply what I'd used in the creation of the series, but it was very detailed in the way that I'd pulled it all together. I have created, to a sense, a rich history of a people connected through their interactions or bloodlines that has helped me to pose some very interesting questions that I've tried to answer within the series itself. Having completed the series and spoken to those who've read it, via comments or social media or on emails. I've, I've been asked many times about the back history of the stories and there were certain characters that people asked about and wanted to know really what their origins were. One example of that would probably be Gwendolyn White Circle. I was asked if I would ever write her full story and to be honest at that time I did not feel to a degree it was worthwhile because by the time I'd actually finished the whole of Heirs to the Kingdom, I was already engaged in writing Rise of the Raven, which I had written more, to be honest, to help me fully understand the perception of Branagh, who was actually the start, really, of everything that created the story of Heirs to the Kingdom. Rise of the Raven was not the story that people expected to read, and it was in many ways very different from the perception that people had, having read The Circle of Darkness, which was the final book in the Heirs to the Kingdom series. Rise of the Raven was written at the same time as the Circle of Darkness, because at the time I only had the bullet points of the story and I needed the full story in order to complete the last book. I did not really intend to write it as a book, but as I started I realized there was actually a really great story here and a different perception to be gained from it. Because in truth, as to the kingdom, in a sense, is the story of the victor. It is to a degree written from the point of view of the winners of the battle. Now in regard to Gwendolyn, as I previously mentioned, I knew that she was in Rise of the Raven as a young princess. So I did to, do, to a degree cover the important aspects of her early life. Simply put, there really was no more story to add. And even though a book which was entitled White Circle would look really good on my writing credits, it would not really serve any value at all to the reader. Which is sort of the point of the whole project of this new story arc, which is to provide more background on things as to the kingdom readers have not previously known or read about. I spend a lot of time in deep thought about the many layers that are woven into HTTK because these are stories you can pull apart and discuss with other readers and it was whilst talking to the one person that I know has read these books far more times than any other person apart from me which is my wife I began to see how readers were picking away at things to finally find deeper clues and insights to the series which to be honest for me personally it was thrilling to know that readers were doing that because that's something I've always done with many many other stories. That created a lot of thought 
and it made me to a degree see this body of work in a very different light. And I started to go back through my notes and pick up on a, a few things and ask myself a lot of very, very interesting questions. Now at this point, having finished the actual series, I knew I deliberately painted a very specific perception of Branagh for the eighth book, which was the view of all the heroes of the story. But because I'd written Rise of the Raven at the same time as book A, I knew that Branagh's story was indeed very different from how it was perceived, and there was actually a really, really good reason behind that. When I was halfway through Kingdom A, I knew I was going to publish Rise of the Raven at some future point, because I felt at the time it was a really, really good backstory. Branagh's story is to a degree a very tragic one, but it is a rich tale to tell, because she was scapegoated. And this was something that struck a very deep chord with me, because it is something I've seen many, many times in my life. How one person can create the wrong perception and then use it as a weapon to control others to hide their own indiscretions. There is a very large element of that within the Curio Chronicles. Rise of the Raven shows that perfectly, but in completing the book, it raised many questions for me and I started to ask the very simple question of just how exactly does evil take hold? And if it does, how does it start? What began in that process was a very long series of questions that I asked myself about just where does every character rise from? I think Robbie and Rune's story are very well documented through the eight books of Earth to the Kingdom. And to a degree in Rise of the Raven, Branagh's beginnings are clearly seen. But I had to ask myself, having written it, what if a lot of what the characters had been led to believe in one story was actually biased? Did that mean that in Heirs to the Kingdom, Robbie and Runestone were being misled with a version of the truth that was not completely correct? And it all led to one place, which was Avalon. The Golden Empire of a Golden Queen, seen by all as the bastion of all that was good in the Fee world, a superpower of wisdom, knowledge and goodness. And that is actually the problem. The crazy thing is, I see a great deal of it today in the political establishment and how they frame their narrative and their behaviour to present one view to the world that is actually very, very different to their ambitions and their own lifestyle. Brunner makes it very clear what a political animal Rhiannon was. And it was clear that Bridget Violet had a major objection to her, which caused a rift between them. It made logical sense that anyone in Avalon at that time would have been influenced by Rhiannon as a queen. After all, she ruled supreme and set the narrative of everything. So it became a simple deduction to me that, well, if that was true, anyone in Avalon at that time would have been misled. And so what they actually told Runestone could actually be flawed information. Enter into the picture the characters of Una, Maddie, Melanie and Fagan. Simple deduction tells us that in the case of Una, Maddie and Mel, they are the daughters of Gwendolyn the Queen of Fae of Earth, but they're also the daughters of Merlin. Now to a degree, they're high profile members of the Fae elite. And so they were sheltered from the harsh reality of the poor. As Branagh points out, there are two lines in the Fae of Moon. Those of dark hair, who were poor and seen as worthless. And then there was those of blonde, who were seen as the perfection of fee society. It was a society, I may add, that at that time was far more advanced than the world of men. Because of the events of Kingdom and how it was written, then it's clear to see that Gwendolyn's daughters were in and around Avalon during the rule of Rhiannon, which to a degree points to the fact that if Rhiannon is to be seen as the wisest of all fee, which she was at that time, it discounts the fact that she was a very political animal that was working things 
to her own advantage. Now this means that Gwendolyn's daughter's version of the truth may not be the actual facts. They were given Rhiannon's manipulated facts. So when you understand that, you suddenly realize what they believe is a modified version of what really happened. And so to, to a degree, I could then deduce that the version Runestone was given was not the full facts, but actually the warped version Rihanna used to hide her indiscretions. You see some of this in Rise of the Raven, especially with Ariel and Luminaria, and I may add at times Fagan. And there will be more very carefully slipped into the soon to be published Countess of Darkness. Runestone would see this as first hand accounts of history, but actually they were not. She would have little need to check them because she was talking to the actual person who was there at the time. And she would have sensed that those she was speaking to utterly believe what they were saying. They were indeed telling the truth. The problem was that the version they were telling was actually Rhiannon's. The same to a degree goes for Fagan, who as we see in the final book of Heirs to the Kingdom, has inherited a lot of the gifts of his mother. One of the things that draws him to the Forest of Time is it is a place where he gets no one bothering him. He actually has a place and the space not to be affected by others so that he can think. Now he admits this in Book 8 of Heirs to the Kingdom. Seers have visions. They see pictures that they interpret to understand the truth. And this led me to actually start to think, because I'd already written Sapphire's struggles to understand her visions with Morgana and the small girl. So it actually made sense to me that Fagin would, with the knowledge he had from Avalon, read these pictures in his mind in a way that fitted in with the narrative of that time. It became a really interesting point and one which I spent a lot of time thinking about. And it also raised the question that if Fagin applied the pictures he saw to what the populace of Avalon were told, and he believed them, when he was ordered to hunt down and kill Morgana, even though he believed she was evil, he could actually be wrong in his perception of the meaning of what the pictures he saw in her actually meant. If you think about it this way, Fagan saw images, but there was no real context to them. It was up to him to determine what each image meant. If you take into account the story that Morgana tried to kill Rhiannon, and then apply the images with that context, Fagan could only ever come to one conclusion, that Morgana had been turned dark, and then had attacked Rhiannon. So ask yourself, when he saw the images of Morgana with a raven, what other conclusion could he possibly have come to? Now for me, it was a groundbreaking flash of inspiration. What if what he told Runestone was not absolutely correct? I asked the question, could Fagin, due to his involvement with the people and the Queen of Avalon, misread the facts when he confronted Morgana in her cottage? and he saw the pictures of her tied to a raven, and it was the same raven as Branna. When it comes to the whole series of eight books, it actually becomes the single most important question, because if Fagin misinterpreted what he saw based on the bias of Rhiannon, it then leads to a whole host of other questions, and I might add, another book. I sat back at that time and absolutely gasped as I thought about it because to a degree I think my mind had already been there for some time. I'd just been so busy with other writing that even though it was there in the back of my mind I'd not really taken the chance to go back and pull together everything that I'd actually written. And that was a task I was about to embark on. I knew to a degree that it had crossed my mind when I was writing Last Arrow of the Woodland Realm, which was a book I never really meant to write. I mean, all the readers know the story, that I became so stuck writing book five as outside pressures 
and people's perceptions were creating problems in my mind. I felt a great pressure to end the series, which again my instincts told me was actually at that time wrong. I solved that problem by just writing what I felt had to be said, and the result was a book that was far too big to publish. I cut one third of the end of the book off, creating the completed book five, and then the first third of what was to become the unscripted book six. Now in many ways that moment became a defining moment in the history of the series. I had one third of a book spare. I already had the start of the story that followed on from what was to be the end of book five and the end of a story that led into the next book, but there was no middle. I knew what the story of the Bridge of Sequana, which would be now the seventh book, and how it would start, and I had that already written, but I wanted it to be in the closing of the next book. But already, because of book five, it had been cut out, and I'd ended book five differently. So by dividing what I had left, and had edited out of book five, and I cut them in half, I had a lot of space to fill, and some time on my hands to fill it, to create what is now the sixth book. Last Arrow of the Woodland Realm started a process that brought me to the point that I'm actually at today, where I looked to the past and I asked, was history actually right? In many ways, I think it was here I began to really consider what would become Rise of the Raven, because I asked myself the very good question of what exactly started all of this? Where does Morgan Le Fay really come from? And what actually is her story? In Last Arrow of the Woodland Realm, I started the process that would lead me to writing the story of Branner and Ariel, and how the mill came down into the realms. I made a lot of notes at that time about Morgan Le Fay's life, and I looked at her early years, and how in the stories of Arthur, it showed Victor to be a reasonably powerful lord who refused to swear allegiance to Uther, who he actually saw as crude and undisciplined. It goes against the narrative of the legend of Arthur, but I wanted to know why he felt that way, and what drove him to ultimately make a pact with Uther, which then led Uther to destroying it by lusting after his wife Egraine. Now this played well in Last Arrow, as Morgan Le Fay accused the council of the murder of her father and the rape of her mother. And it allowed me to play a little bit with her character and open her up a little bit so that I could show the different sides of her, especially around her assistant Ursula. I cannot deny, when I was writing book six, it still is one of my happiest times writing Heirs to the Kingdom, as I was also exploring other aspects of the books as a reader would and it gave me the chance to explain much more of the depth of the story and the wealth of information that I actually pulled together. It still is one of my favorite books of the series, and it was my introduction of another wonderful character, which was Fagin. I said at that time, he would only ever be in one book, but such was my joy of writing him. I found reasons in other books to go back and visit him. Okay, so, to try and pull all of this back together. I had several good threads. I had Rise of the Raven and Branna's story. I had Gwendolyn's daughter's versions of events in Heirs to the Kingdom. And I also had Fagin's visions, as well as the story of King Arthur and how Uther managed to invade Tintagel and sleep with a grain to create Arthur and make Tintagel his birthplace. Now to add to that, I had to consider that Rhiannon controlled the narrative of that time and had to a degree given a false perception of the truth, which was what everybody believed. All of these were threads that led to one aspect of this story. They all connected to who at that time was Morgana of Cornwall, later to be known as the Dark One, or as Fagan referred to her, little dark eyes. In Rise of the Raven, it's clear what Branna's story is and the injustice she feels for the way Rhiannon has not only treated her, but also treated her own kind. The Circle of Darkness shows us the end of her life 
And it is clear in that book that Branagh has a lot of trust in Morgana. So how did that happen? As Morgana does not even feature in Rise of the Raven. Hence, the next book. To lay out what became a book dedicated to Morgana of Cornwall, or as we saw in the Circle of Darkness, she was called Morgana of Berengar. I asked myself simple questions. Who was she? Where did she come from? What was she like as a child? And most importantly, how did she become the dark figure that everybody feared? Now taking the view that she was not born evil, as even Branna had to be tied to Roke before her darkness engulfed her, that could mean that Morgana started out as a young child being raised by her parents. Now in Esther the Kingdom during one of the introductions I make it very clear she was loved by her parents and spoiled a little. And yet the character of the Dark One was filled with anger and rage. Almost like she was angry at the world and everyone in it. So why was she so angry? What was the reason for her endless rage? And why was she so determined to destroy the heirs of Arthur? In Rise of the Raven we meet Victor, son of Maud and grandson of Branna. Now Branna favours Victor as he's very intelligent and she helps him to mastermind his landing at Tintagel as she advises him to conquer by using loyalty that is earned through good deeds. It's a really, really important aspect of the story as a whole because it is here I'm already working on what will become another book. And so I started to set up a connection that would bridge the two books. That connection to Branna was massively important because the thread would run from her to Morgana. Now it's clear in the Circle of Darkness that Branna trusts Morgana, which when you consider how cutthroat the family have become, it's actually quite surprising. But there clearly is a bond between them but how did that form, considering Branna is hidden in her own realm and Morgana is actually at Tintagel? Taking into account that Morgana is just a normal child who loves her parents and idolises her father, and then add in all the facts from the Arthurian legend and Heirs to the Kingdom, and yet understanding the fact that she is actually the great granddaughter of Branna and all of the ingredients come together for the making of a tale that has not yet been told. It's a tale worth telling, because as I realised during the writing of The Last Hour of the Woodland Realm, Morgana's story is complex, with lots of questions, such as, why did she have a cottage in Avalon? I mean, why did Merlin, who helped kill her father, take her on as a student of the White Lines if she was so evil? How did she know Fagin, really? And why did she kill Eleanor and Eve and not Merlin or Opal, who she actually sent to the Hidden Realm to suffer? Why take Gwendolyn, her children and Hearn, and seal them in tubes of crystal to begin the Age of Sleep? I suppose the most important question though is, how come Rhiannon survived and then left Avalon, sealing it behind her? There's a really good series of questions to answer here, and that is what I've set out to do, as I've looked deeply into the life of Morgana, Countess of Cornwall, of the line of Berengar. As a result of writing the notes of this story from the project that I started during the time of writing The Last Arrow of the Woodland Realm, and after a really long time, i finally written Morgana's story. And it is a story of power, accusation, plot twists and intrigue. And it is a story that will become, I feel, the most essential read for anyone who's read Esther to the Kingdom. Because in telling her story, I've peeled back more layers than ever before to expose the bare bones and the heart of all of that has become Heirs to the Kingdom. I set out with one thing in mind, this would not be a retelling of the story of Arthur. It would actually be a story that ran parallel as Arthur got on with his things and Morgana would step in and out 
as she was connected to certain important aspects of the legend. Not a huge amount has been written about Morgana in the past, and the legend that surrounds her is kind of more speculation than actual written history. So that for me allowed me a lot of latitude to play with her storyline. I took her narrative from The Last Arrow, and I made that the foundation of the story, and I worked around it. And obviously, there was links to Branagh, which will bring her into this story. In Kingdom, I've everything that has been written about her, and so to a degree, that's directed the plot of the story. And in the back of my mind, I could never get over the point that as a small girl at the age of four, her father, who she idolized, was killed and she saw her mother sexually taken by Uther. In her mind, because he was using magic which she saw right through, as he did not appear to her as her father like he did a grain, she saw him as Uther. So to her it was obvious that Uther rapes her mother. If you think about it, she's not really wrong. The grain at that time thought she was in congress with her husband. She had no idea that Merlin had used magic to change Uther's identity. This is the one fact in Last Arrow of the Woodland Realm that the ruling council try to airbrush over. They avoid the issue and instead they talk of how Uther tried to be nice to her but she pushed him away. No one at that point I felt understood that what Morgana was doing was telling the truth of what her four year old self saw. As a child, for her, she saw that as a brute of a man raping her mother. And no matter what shades of grey you try to whitewash this with, in this one case, Morgana is the witness to the actual event, and the ruling council are wrong, because Morgana's version is actually far more accurate than theirs, because she was there at the base of the bed and she saw it with her own two eyes. Morgana has every right to be hurt and angry by what Merlin and Uther did, because it was a despicable act. In the last arrow of the Woodland Realm, when Morgana points the finger and accuses all of them for being complicit in her father's death and the rape of her mother, the very simple fact is, in a weird sort of twist, she has actually got more right than the council to hold the moral high ground and she is actually justified in her accusation. At that moment, she is no longer the dark one. She's the hurt and frightened four-year-old Morgana of Cornwall and yet no one can see it and they refuse to accept it. At that point, I asked one question of myself. How does a four-year-old little girl deal with seeing her mother raped and then discovering her father is dead and continuing to live in a world where everyone denies her very real and powerful feelings? That is the story that I have written. The truth of a little girl who grows up isolated and alone in a world where her father has been replaced by the man who raped her mother. That is the story of the Countess of Darkness. It will be the next book I publish. It will be out very soon. And I will offer it all to all of you so you too can explore deeper into the world of Heirs to the Kingdom. As with all of the books that I write, if you enjoy it, please do not be quiet about it. Authors really need talkers so tell people, share your enjoyment and look me up on social media and like, share and comment on the posts I put up so that I can let other people know if my books are enjoyed and loved by others. Again, with this channel, this podcast, you know, it will get better. <laughs> but if you can, subscribe, like the posts because that helps me get a much larger reach across YouTube so that other readers will find the stuff that I'm putting together. My thanks to everyone who's listened to this, and I hope you will keep tuning in, and in your spare time, turning the pages, reading the lines, and expanding your own minds. 
My thank you to all of you who have supported my writer's life and are supporting the Writer's Life podcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Writer Life podcast. If you have enjoyed this episode, or there are areas of Robin's stories you would like him to discuss, please add your thoughts and questions in the comments, and we will include them in a future episode. You can follow Robin on all his social media links, which you will find listed below. And please, like and subscribe to this channel, so you get the latest notifications when he posts. All Robin's books are available in digital and print formats to purchase or download through all online book sales sites.